So we're on questions of application with regard to the epistles. Um, so when Paul is ministering to the people in Corinth and teaching them how to be Christians, he's probably trying to teach them how to live in a way that's consistent with being a follower of Jesus. Um, but, I mean, it's hard in the church today, you know, for people to do that. So I imagine in that context, where they, they didn't know anything about being Christians, um, it was particularly hard. And so he runs into every kind of problem, really, that you can imagine. Um, now remember, Corinth is a town that's known for um, sexual license. And so in chapter 5, he addresses something he's been told, which is that, 5.1, he says, it is actually reported that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that is not even found among pagans, for a man is living with his father's wife. And you are arrogant, should you have not ra rather have mourned so that he who has done this would have been removed from among you. Now, the problem here, I guess, is that not only is, was there a man living with his father's wife, who's part of the Christian community, but the community is allowing this to go on and not doing anything about it. Okay, so he says, for though absent in body, verse 3, absent in body, I am present in spirit, and as if present, I have already pronounced judgment in the name of the Lord Jesus on the man who has done such a thing. When you are assembled, and my spirit is present with the power of our Lord Jesus, you are to hand this man over to Satan for the destruction of the flesh, so that his spirit may be saved in the day of the Lord. Okay, now what do you think that means? What's he, what's he instructing them to do? It sounds a lot like Salem witch trial. Witch trial. I mean, okay. I mean, it sounds like a witch trial? No, it, it sounds like there's some similarities. What happens to him? Well, you've got, you've, got a, you've got here a man who is living in a state of sexual immorality. And the church is permitting this to go on and not doing anything about it. And so what Paul is saying is, um, what you should have done is you should have expelled this man from the community. That means hand him over to Satan. Is this called shunning? This would be shunning, yeah. So I don't, I'm sorry. You know what shunning is? No, I, was just, I thought you asked about Satan. But it's not permanent shunning because what Paul says is he's to be handed over for the destruction of the flesh so that he, he may be saved. In other words, Paul wants this man to repent he doesn't want them permanently kicked out of the community. He wants them to repent. And so this is a manner of early church discipline. Gary, were you going to ask a question? Yeah, I was just going to ask, why don't we do this today? Well, some communities do do this today. Um, that shunning is still a real thing. And church discipline is a tricky thing. I mean, you have to have church discipline. At the same time, you don't want to go crazy with church discipline. And it seems that different Christian communities have a hard time striking a balance between, you know, and finding the right amount and severity of church discipline. It's a hard thing to do. So in some, some traditions, uh, there's almost no church discipline. And then in some, it can be very severe. Jim? The list continues, and if you read verse 11 in your version, uh... Right. So, I am writing to you not to associate with anyone who bears the name of brother or sister. <coughs> in other words, if someone is a believer in your community, a member of the Christian community, 
Um, you should not associate them if they are sexually immoral or greedy or an idolater, reveler, uh, drunkard, or robber. Okay, so what? So this is how Paul is trying to establish discipline in the community. Now, there are other places in the New Testament that also have... Um, examples for how you bring about discipline in your community. Like in Matthew, when Jesus says, um, is it Matthew, is it Matthew 9? 19. 19. Matthew 19, yeah. Where Jesus says, you know, take, um, you know, if someone has offended you, you go and you confront that person, and then you take two witnesses, and then you tell it to the church. And then if they still won't repent, then let that person be to you like a tax collector or a Gentile. Okay, John Wesley actually has a sermon on this, um, on evil speaking. And uh, so there's Jesus, you know, in Matthew has a little bit different version of what church discipline looks like. And this is something that the early Christians were trying to figure out. So, you know, Fee is talking about, I mean, one of the things that Fee and Stuart talk about in the book is how you derive instructions about the life of the church from passages like this one? You know, do you take the specifics that Paul is talking about, or do you try to derive principles from what Paul says? So, for example, one read of this that you could apply to the life of the church would be, um, the church needs to take issues of sexual morality seriously. These have real consequences for Christian life. And at the same time, we might want to think about different ways of church discipline besides handing people over to Satan or shunning them. Okay, there might be other ways to do that. So we can get at a specific principle, perhaps, without always... Um, Uh, following through with the specific instructions that Paul gave to a specific community for specific circumstances. Does that make sense? Yes. Is it also true that these are missionary churches and our church is not a missionary church? And for a few years since, we might have more sophisticated ways of working with people? Maybe so these are missionary churches and we're kind of more institutionalized churches, and so we might have different ways of church discipline. Yeah, and again, you know, I don't think that the fact that Paul says to shun this man means that that's how we should always go about church discipline. But I think Paul would say, I think the principle we can derive from this is that Christian communities do need to have a standard of behavior. And we have to have ways of implementing that standard of behavior within our communities. And so the importance of having these fences is for maintaining relationships. And if you do some of the things of the bad guys in 511, that this breaks up relationships, and so you can't have a covenant community with people breaking up relationships. So the, the sins break relationships, and that's why you enforce. Uh, I think that's one reason. I think another is that Paul thought that people endangered their own salvation by acting in ways that were immoral. And they endangered the salvation of others if this kind of immorality spread through the community. Mm -hmm. And so what he wants to do is he wants people to act in a way that's consistent with God's righteousness um, in order to maintain the righteousness of the community for salvation. Okay, because as he, he goes on to say in 6.12, right, all things are lawful for me. So 
I don't do these things simply. I don't. I don't. You know. I don't refrain from certain behaviors simply because it's because the law tells me not to. So all things are lawful for me, but not all things are beneficial. So you could, you know, you could make that argument about drunkenness. Paul would say, you know, if you said to Paul, Paul, why shouldn't we, you know, go get drunk? And Paul would say, well, it's not because the law says don't get drunk. In fact, I'm not aware of where it might even say that in the law. But it's just not good for you because when you go get drunk, you do things you shouldn't do, and it's bad for your health, and you feel bad the next day, and all kinds of stuff like that. Okay, so all things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. So food is meant for the stomach, and the stomach for food, and God will destroy both one and the other. The body is meant not for fornication, but for the Lord, and the Lord for the body. Okay, so what he's getting at here is that there are ways that we live that are beneficial for us, and also the way that we live has an effect on our relationship with God. If we're living in ways that God doesn't want us to live, then that's going to hurt our relationship with God. Okay, so, and he uses the example of men who go to prostitutes here. He says in verse 15, Do you not know that your bodies of, are members of Christ? Should I therefore take the members of Christ and make them members of a prostitute? So, in other words, if your body is a member of Christ, then you don't want to do something that's outside of the bounds of God's will, was something that has been consecrated to God. Okay, so again, we can take this principle, and it doesn't have to be, you know, something like prostitution. It could be like uh, uh, drug abuse, for example. Okay, well, you know, why don't, why don't we want people, why do Christians say, well, you, you shouldn't, you know, you shouldn't use drugs? Well, a couple of reasons. One, is um, it's, it's just not beneficial for you, right? It's just bad for you. People's lives get ruined in this way. But for another thing, it doesn't take seriously enough the idea that you, as a baptized person, um, are consecrated to God. And so you need to treat your body as something that has been consecrated to God and take care of it. And so if you're, you know, sitting around getting high five days a week or doing meth or something like that, that's not treating yourself as if it were consecrated to God. Okay, so you can see, you know, that, that part of what we can, part of what Fee wants us to be able to do is to identify certain moral principles out of Paul's writings that we can then apply to the Christian life. And sometimes the, the specific instructions are not as important as the principles behind the specific instructions. How, what, how are we doing on time? About 11. Oh, we're at 11 minutes, okay. Okay, the same thing would apply in, um, we can derive um, some principles for the Christian life together from chapter 11, starting with verse 17. Now here, Paul is upset with the Corinthians. Um, look at verse 20. Chapter 11, verse 20. When you come together, it is not really to eat the Lord's Supper. Um, for when the time comes to eat, each of you goes ahead with your own supper, and one goes hungry, and another becomes drunk. What? Do you not have homes to eat and drink in? 
Or do you show contempt for the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? Okay, so what's going on here? They're coming together for the Lord's Supper. So this is a, this is a sacred meal, right? This is a, a Christian ritual that they're engaging in. And what's happening? Okay, and is everyone doing that, or are just some people doing that? No, most of them are. Just some, because those who have nothing. Yeah. yeah. So there are some people who seem to have food right. and wine, and they're, they're pigging out. And there are other people who don't have anything, and they're going hungry. And this is the Lord's Supper we're talking about. And that's why Paul quotes the words of institution, say, this isn't just any meal. No. So verse 23, chapter 11, verse 23, For I see from the Lord what I also handed on to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took a loaf of bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body that is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took a cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Now, the Lord's death is a sacrifice for us. Mm -hmm. And so if we're proclaiming Christ's sacrifice, but not living sacrificially, then we make hypocrites of ourselves. Okay, so you could take this principle and you could apply it to a lot of different um, aspects of life. So, for example, um, we don't have this particular problem at our church because we don't practice the Lord's Supper as a meal. Mm -hmm. We have communion and we take a piece of bread and we dip it into a little bit of grape juice and we eat the bread with the grape juice on it and that's it. Okay, and there's always enough because we always buy several loaves of bread. Um, but there are other ways in which we could apply this principle about caring for others as a Christian community. And, um, and also the obligation that it puts on us when we receive the body and the blood of Christ. I mean, Christ sacrificed everything for us. And so what obligation does that put on us as his followers for other people? Okay, so that's what, that's what Fee is talking about in terms of deriving principles from Paul. Even if the exact um, scenario might not apply in our context. Okay, with that, why don't we wrap it up?